Take your Bibles, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Today's July the 4th. It's a special day. It's a special day. It's the 245th birthday of the United States of America. And whether you realize it or not, there's no other country in the world that's celebrating July the 4th except for us. It's true. Nobody else is but us. China's not. Russia is not. Iraq and Iran are not. The United Kingdom is not. We are the only ones celebrating our nation's birthday, which is why today is a very special day. And I'll just go ahead and say it right now. Though we may still have a whole lot of problems as a nation, and we do, let's be frank and honest. We still have a lot of issues, lots of problems and challenges and difficulties as we are reminded of every single day. But I'll say this, I would still rather live here than anywhere else in the world. I'm just saying, that's me. I've traveled to a lot of places in my lifetime, a lot of countries around the world, and I've enjoyed every one of them. They're beautiful. I've been blessed to visit them. The people there are, are fantastic. But I'm just going to say it right now. When it comes to the context of living, I'd still rather be here because the freedoms and liberties that we enjoy here are unique solely to us. The song says, My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, let every mountainside, let freedom ring. The United States of America is still a place like no other place in the world where freedom and opportunities can still be found. That's why every day people are still trying to come here. People are trying to come here every day, and we can talk about the border crisis if you want. The reality is, is that the United States is a place like none of that's why people want to come here. And who can blame them? Because at some point in all of our lives, our families were immigrants. Listen, we're so blessed, so wonderfully blessed to live in the United States. And we should never take it for granted. 245 years ago today, 56 men representing the 13 original colonies signed a Declaration of Independence. They were proclaiming to King George III of England and the British Empire and the rest of the world that we were a free and sovereign nation. And after six more plus years of war and fighting, our freedom was secured with the signing of the Treaty of Paris on September the 3rd, 1783. But it all began on this day 245 years ago. Two years prior, they'd already been fighting. Since 1774 to 1776, they had already been fighting. But at that point, they were fighting for the right for their voice to be heard. But after this day, 245 years ago, they were fighting for freedom. And what a beautiful word, freedom. I don't know if any of us who have been born into this country can truly appreciate what that word freedom means in the context of living unless we've experienced other cultures overseas who didn't have it because we've known nothing else but freedom. We may know about the word free, but the word freedom is something more. When we think of the word free, we immediately interpret it to mean that it's not going to cost us anything. It's free. It's gratis. It's like going down to Sam's Club or some of the places giving out the free samples of food and we line up ready to get our free sample. And we've all done it. I've watched... Young people, I've seen people go from this station to that station. I'm, I'm just laughing. Because the problem is I'm right behind them. What's free at that? Oh, get that. Oh, ooh, that's good. Oh, that's good. We understand what's free. We think that it's not going to cost us anything. But the word freedom, it brings to our mind a different thought than something that's just simply free. It conjures up images in our mind that was something that was paid for with a high price, and it's true. Freedom is costly. 
Where free may not mean anything to us because it's just something we get without paying for anything. Freedom conjures up this idea in our thoughts of mind that something was paid for at a high price. And it's true even in American history, from the American Revolution to the American Civil War, from the World Wars and more. Human freedom is something that's costly to attain and costly to hold on to, which is why we have armed forces today stationed around the world because freedom comes at a very high price. But there's something about freedom, and this is what I want you to hear. We can live in a land where we're physically free, where freedom abounds everywhere that we look, and yet for people personally, they can still be bound. It's amazing. You can live where freedom is everywhere, and yet finally yourself still bound. I'm talking today about greater freedom. Greater freedom. See, what is it that makes a person free? I think that's a very appropriate question on July the 4th weekend. What makes us free? I mean, just because we, we live in a country that is free doesn't mean that we're free, right? Because we all know people in the course of living that are having some kind of form of bondage or captivity. And I'm not talking about those behind a prison wall. I'm talking about your neighbors talking about your co-workers, your family members, or maybe you yourself, who may be living free on the outside, but on the inside you're bound. You're locked up in a prison of addiction and hate and corruption and guilt and sin. Physically you may be free, but inwardly, emotionally, and spiritually, you are more bound than anybody that's locked up in a prison wall. Because here's the truth. Freedom. Everybody say the word freedom. Freedom, true freedom isn't found in where you live, but it's found in how you live, or better yet, it's found in who lives inside of you. See, that's the point that Jesus is making in John chapter 8, and I love the song that they sing because it comes out of this verse, John 8, 36. That's the point Jesus is making when he's speaking to this group of Jewish men and women who have gathered near to him to listen. They were the biological descendants of Abraham. God had physically delivered them from Egypt through Moses, and yet inwardly they were still bound, and they couldn't quite comprehend what Jesus was trying to say to them. Look at John chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. Listen to what Jesus says. He says to the people who believed in him, he says, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. Did everybody hear that one? You are truly my disciples if... Everybody say the word if. We forget that one. If you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you what? Free. Verse 33 says, but they said, but we are descendants of Abraham. We have never been slaves to anyone they themselves had not been born into slavery. We have never been slaves to anyone. With the sense of Abraham, what do you mean you will set us free? And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. And a slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is a part of the family. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed, or you are truly free. Jesus was speaking about a freedom that could only be experienced through personal relationship with him. And yet those who were listening couldn't comprehend it. But what he was saying was that there was no other way to truly be free and to experience true freedom without having a relationship that was found in him. Listen, I, I've said this before, but freedom really is a relative term. Because I have learned that you can be physically bound and still be mentally and emotionally and spiritually free. Think about some of the men in our penal institutions or some of the women that are there. Harris County Jail or, or Huntsville State Prison. We've got countless men and women that are incarcerated in both. And when you think about them, our first thoughts are they've lost their freedom. And it's true. They're not free to go to Baskin Robbins, have 31 flavors of ice cream. They're not free to go to Rudy's Barbecue. They're not free to go to Papa Cena's restaurant. But here's the truth, friends. Many of them have greater freedom than some who are walking outside those prison walls because they have come to know the great emancipator named Jesus Christ. 
Jesus said in John 8, 36, he says, so if the Son sets you free, you are truly freed, or you are free indeed. And there are millions upon millions living outside prison walls who we would call free, but who are incarcerated on the inside because they're bound to the sin that holds them in captive. They have physical freedom, but inwardly they are mentally and emotionally, and they are spiritually bound. You see, freedom truly is a relative term because there are people in this room probably right here this morning that you are free physically, but inwardly you're bound. And you may have chains on your life that nobody even sitting beside you is unaware of, but you have chains because you're bound. You're bound in here, and you're bound in here. Jesus said, if the Son will set you free, you can be truly free. See, freedom is a relative term. But here's also about freedom. Freedom is also a choice. Look at your neighbor and say, freedom is a choice. Again, if you were to look, ask people on the streets of America if they're free or not, most of them would probably say, yeah, we're free. But are they really free? Because there's really no such thing as absolute freedom. We may live in a free society given rights and freedoms by our constitutions, but the fact is that we're never really free without Jesus Christ. Even in America, only he can make us truly free because there's no freedom apart from him. We may live in the land whose motto is the home of the free and the brave, but don't be deceived. Our freedom is an illusion if we don't know Jesus as our personal Savior. Without Jesus, we're not really free at all. Instead, we're captives to our own imagination, slaves to the sin of our choice. That's the essence of what Jesus is saying in John chapter 8. He says, you may be the descendants of Abraham, but don't, don't deceive yourself. You're still bound by sin. The Bible says, all have sinned, Romans 3, 23, and fallen short of the God's glorious standard. But Jesus says in John 8, 32, and you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. So if the Son will set you free, verse 36, you are truly free. What he's saying is that you have the ability to choose him. You have the ability to choose to be free and experience what real freedom is. But that's why freedom is a choice. See, that's why it doesn't matter what country we reside in. That's why it doesn't matter whether we're locked up inside a prison wall or we're walking unencumbered down the streets of Houston somewhere. Freedom and bondage are a choice. And the right choice Choosing Christ gives life. It gives us freedom, greater freedom. But the wrong choice, rejecting Christ, keeps us bound and changed into the captivity of our own sin, the sin of our choosing. We choose it for ourselves. Don't be mistaken. Somebody says, I can't help it. No, you choose for yourself. You can either choose Christ or you can choose to reject him. He'll set you free. But if you choose to reject Christ, you say what you're saying is, I don't want freedom. I would rather stay in my chains. Whom the Son sets free is truly free. We have the choice to make. We have to choose to be free. You see, freedom, true freedom, greater freedom is found in Jesus Christ alone. The Apostle Peter, the big fisherman who was always speaking before he thought about things, he came to experience that freedom. James and John, the sons of thunder, who were very good at wanting God to bring down fire to consume their enemies, they came to know that freedom. Matthew, the tax collector, who was good at taking from others in order to line his own pockets, he came to experience that freedom. Simon the zealot, who at one time thought of himself as a freedom fighter before he met Jesus, came to experience that true freedom that transformed his life. Listen, freedom is relative, and it's a choice, and all of us can choose it if we want it. I think about the Apostle Paul. At one point in his life, he was bound and shackled by sins of anger and hate and prejudice disguised in the zeal for his traditions and his religion. But on a Damascus road in Acts chapter 9, he has an encounter with the living Christ and Jesus sets him free and his life is never the same. And he goes from being the chief persecutor of Christians in the message of Jesus to being the chief evangelist and the proclaimer of the good news about Jesus. You see, Paul knew what it was to experience real freedom and to be genuinely free, even though he spent much of the rest of his life in chains. Why? Well, John Maxwell says it this way. It's because Paul had discovered that in Jesus, he had nothing to hide 
In Jesus, he had nothing to lose, and in Jesus, he had nothing to fear. Aren't you glad that in Jesus, we have nothing to hide? Our sins have been washed away. All things have passed away. All things have become new. We have nothing to lose. Everything that we have has been poured upon Christ, and we have nothing to fear because in him, we're going to win no matter what. Romans 8 says in verse 31, And what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then condemns us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. So can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or a persecutor or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No. Verse 37, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. 2 Corinthians 4 says this. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day for our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them all and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles that we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Friends, real freedom, greater freedom is only experienced when we choose Jesus. He is the only one who makes a difference because in him we have nothing to hide. In him we have nothing to lose. And in him we have nothing to fear. See, what do you do with people like that? What do you do with people that can't be intimidated? What do you do with those who, who are so committed to a cause that fear becomes inconsequential? Because that's who we're supposed to be in Jesus. We've got nothing to hide. We've got nothing to lose. And we've got nothing to fear. Why? Because we've experienced true freedom, greater freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you deal with people like that? Think of a story that Senator John McCain told after he had come back from being a POW for five and a half years in North Vietnam. He talked about a man that he met there he was in prison with by the man, man by the name of a Mike Christian. He was a lieutenant colonel or lieutenant commander. He said that Mike had collected scraps of white and red cloth. He had sewed the, the white and uh, red cloth scraps into an American flag on the inside of his blue pajama top. He said the men every night would hang Mike's pajama top on the wall. And they would say the Pledge of Allegiance to it. He said it was a ritual they did every single night. They brought them in together to remind them who they were, where they were from, what they stood for and their purpose. But he said that one day one of the guards happened to catch them in saying the pledge. And they ended up dragging Mike away and beating him brutally, severely. But then he said, the very night that Mike was returned to his cell, battered and bruised, his face swollen. He went right back to gathering pieces of cloth again in order to start making another American flag. What do you do with people who are so committed to a cause that fear becomes inconsequential? Nothing to hide. Nothing to lose. Nothing to fear. That was the Apostle Paul. He had come to know, experience the greater freedom that only comes in knowing Jesus is Lord. And that freedom emboldened him to go out and to preach the gospel. Unconcerned. He had nothing to hide, nothing to lose, nothing to fear. Because he was free. Free in here. And free in here. 
She says, apart from Christ, there is no real freedom in the world at all. And friends, if you're not free towards God, then you're not free at all. See, greater freedom is knowing that no power on earth can destroy us. Greater freedom is knowing that our sins have been forgiven. That's the greatest freedom in all the world. As 1 John 1, 9 says, that he would confess our sins to him. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness or wickedness. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. That's real freedom. And when we have that kind of freedom, we have nothing to hide, nothing to lose, and nothing to fear. And we can live in this land unencumbered and stand for Jesus Christ unafraid because we have real freedom. Just because you're an American, just because you live in the United States doesn't mean you're free. What makes you free is Jesus living in here who has changed how you think about yourself here. I love the song written by John Egan, made famous by the newsboys. It says, through you the blind will see. Through you the mute will sing. Through you the dead will rise. Through you all hearts will praise. Through you the darkness flees. Through you my heart screams, I am free. Yes, I am free. Through you the kingdom comes. Through you the battle's won. Through you I'm not afraid. Through you, the price is prayed. Through you, there's victory. Because of you, my soul sings, I am free. Yes, I am free. I am free to run. I am free to dance. I am free to live for you. I am free. Yes, I am free. And whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Free indeed. Real freedom began at the cross when Jesus was crucified. It was consummated at the empty tomb when Jesus arose from the dead. And it's fully experienced when we realize in our own lives that Jesus is the only way. And we accept what he offered to us, made possible through the blood of Jesus. Think of the song I used to sing as a kid. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I said earlier that when we think of a word free, we interpret it immediately to mean something that's not going to cost us anything. It's gratis. It's free. But the word freedom conjures up images of something that was paid for with a high price. And friends, both are true concerning Jesus and his gift that he offers us. Jesus made his freedom, his salvation available to all for free. All we have to do is accept it. All we have to do is receive him as Lord and Savior and then follow him in obedience. Jesus said in John in Matthew 11, verse 8, 28, he says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. He says in Revelation 22, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this, come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires a drink, to drink freely from the water of life. Let them come. Revelation 3.20, look, I stand at the door and knock, and if you will hear and open the door, I will come in, and I will share a meal together with them as friends. Listen, salvation is free. But it's only free because Jesus is willing to pay the high price for that freedom. And today he wants us all to experience that unimaginable freedom, that greater freedom. Freedom from our past. Freedom from our present, our addictions, our, 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 the guilt, the shame, all that we have that have locked up inside of here and here. He wants to free us from it. If we'll willingly say, Lord, here I am. I'll take it. Give it to me. If I was to take a $100 bill out of my pocket, and I don't have one, but if I had a $100 bill out of my, in my billfold and I took it and I laid it here in the front, I said it's free to whoever wants to come and get it. Can I tell you, people jump out of their seat and come get it. Jesus offers us something more. 
something greater. It's the gift of eternal life, freedom from guilt and sin. But we have to be willing to come and receive it. It's the bottom line. It's free. The salvation is, but our freedom costs Jesus everything. But Hebrews 12, 1 says he was willing to do it for the joy that was set before him. He was willing to go to the cross for you and for me. As I get ready to close, I think if ushers want to start getting ready for communion, you can. I think about a story I read about a 19-year-old kid who was critically wounded and dying in the jungle of the Ladrang Valley on November the 14th, 1965. The Vietnam War had just began and his unit was outnumbered eight to one. The enemy fire was so intense that medevac helicopters stopped coming in. They refused to come in. His family was 12,000 miles away and he knew that he would never see them again. And then all of a sudden, over the machine gun fire and all the noise, he faintly heard the sound of a helicopter. And he looked up to see an unarmed Huey helicopter, but it didn't seem real because there were no medevac markings on the helicopter at all. Inside was a man by the name of Ed Freeman, a man who had already served his country in two wars, in World War II, and in the Korean War, he was just about the near retirement when the Vietnam War began. He wasn't even a medic. That wasn't his job. He was simply a pilot. But at the staging area, when the commanding officer, Army Major Bruce Crandall, called for volunteers, for pilots to volunteer to fly back, he was the only one that raised his hand and says, I'll go. His comments were, I put them in there. It seems right that I should get him out. For him, it wasn't an option. So he flew that Huey helicopter down to the machine gun fire, even after medevatics and other pilots refused to go in. He dropped it in, and he sat there taking machine gun fire. They loaded two or three soldiers on board. Then he flew out through the gunfire back to the place where doctors and nurses were waiting, and he kept coming back another 13 more times, taking 30 soldiers who would have never gotten out without him. The Battle of the Drang was so intense that a book and later movie was made about it. It's entitled, We Were Soldiers. Mel Gibson starred in the movie. For his heroism, Ed Freeman received the Congressional Medal of Honor because he kept coming back to rescue others and bring them home to a place where they could find ultimately freedom and healing for their pain, their wound and their brokenness. When no one else would go in, he volunteered. He said, I'll go. Friends, that's Jesus. He's coming to our world. When no one else could, he took the enemy fire and he made it possible to all of us myself included, could find freedom and healing for our brokenness, our pain, and our wounds. See, real freedom, greater freedom, is not found in living in the United States. It's not being able to go where you want to go, buy the clothes you want to buy, drive the car you want to drive. It's not found in those things. Because we know people that do all of those things and yet they're bound in here and they're bound in here. Real freedom is when Jesus comes in and he sets you free. And as he said, whom the Son will set free, they are free indeed. Totally free. We're getting ready to take communion. You know what communion is? Communion is a reminder 
that our freedom came at a price. But it's also the reminder that because of the price, we can be free. July the 4th. They're going to shoot fireworks today. We're going to shoot fireworks tonight. You need to come back just to see the fireworks. But you know what the fireworks are for today? For us? This is right here. Freedom. To be free. Truly free. Is only found because of Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me? I wonder today if there's somebody in this room who would lift your hand and say with me, Pastor Larry, I may be living in the land of freedom, but I'm not free. I am bound on the inside, bound in my mind and bound in my heart, bound by sin that I have allowed, that I have chosen. But today I am ready to commit it all to Jesus. I'm ready to experience freedom that only he can give. If that would be you, would you just slip a hand right up and put it right back down? God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. Who else? God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, sir. Who else? Who else? God bless you. I see your hand on the side there. Who else would lift your hand and say, Pastor Larry, that's me. God bless you, ma'am, for your honesty. Thank you for lifting your hand. Who else would lift your hand and join these? See, a lot of us can have the illusion that we're free and yet be bound. That's the essence that Jesus was trying to make in John chapter 8. They said, we're the descendants of Abraham. What do you mean we're slaves? What do you mean? Sometimes we can have the illusion and say, well, we go to church. Or my parents are this. Or I used to do that. And the reality is, is that we've slipped right back into the same old habits and the same old ways. And not even realizing it, we're bound. Anyone else want to lift your hand? Just say, Pastor Lee, would you pray for me? Anyone else? God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. I want to pray. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. Whom the Son sets free is truly free. They're the ones that are free. Whom the Son sets free, they're free. And until that happens, see, freedom is a relative term and it's a choice. We can choose it today. I want you to ask everybody if you will pray this prayer with me. We're getting ready to take communion. And I think it's interesting because the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when he was trying to correct some abuses about communion that were happening in the church, he went on to say that talking about being such a sacred moment and a sacred time, realizing the cost that was paid that we might be free. He said that some people were sick. Go and read it. Because they had abused the, the, the communion time, they had abused it. They, they were still living in sin and treating the price that Jesus paid with disrespect. And that's why he says that we have to make sure that our hearts are ready to meet the Lord, that we're right with Jesus before we take communion. Would you pray this prayer with me, everybody in this building? It, it may not be applicable to you because you know that you are living in a right place with Jesus Christ today, but because there was somebody that maybe that beside you lifted their hand and you don't know it because our heads were bowed and our eyes were closed, you want to be an encouragement to them who's also going to be praying this prayer. And I'll be honest, I'm asking Jesus every day, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Because because sometimes we commit sin and we don't even know we did. Sometimes the sin is our attitude. The sin is our thoughts. Would you pray this prayer? Say, Lord Jesus, I need you today. 
I want to experience real freedom, true freedom that only comes in knowing you. You know who I am. You know the things that I struggle with, the things that have had me bound. But today I'm choosing you. I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and to deliver me. Who the Son sets free is truly free. And I'm asking you today for freedom. Freedom from my past. Freedom from my guilt. Freedom from my shame. And freedom from my sin. I surrender it all to you. I give it all to you. I choose you. Be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. May you say thank you, Jesus? Anybody say thank you, Jesus? Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Thank you, Jesus. Our ushers are going to start passing out the elements for communion. They're going to give you a little cup. That little cup has a little wafer that's on the top of it. You're going to peel back that top layer to, to, to get the, the wafer out. Then there's a second layer, and underneath that second layer is where the communion juice is at. We ask you to go ahead and be ready, and we're going to do it together in just a moment. We'll eat together, we'll drink together, all together. But while we're waiting on everybody to be served, can we just spend some time in reflection thanking the Jesus for what he did for us, remembering the price that he paid, the cost that was given so that we might be free. Can we do that? Luke, just begin to, to lead us together. Thank you, Lord. Oh, the blood Crimson love Rise of lies Demand Shameful sin Based on him The whole of heaven Washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. Oh, what a sacrifice that saved my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory. Son, Holy One, slain so I can live. Oh, see the Lamb, the great I am, who takes away my sin. Blood of Jesus washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. Oh, what a sacrifice to save my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory.
the blind It is my victory Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11 For I pass on you what I received from the Lord himself That on the night that he was betrayed The Lord Jesus took some bread And he gave thanks to God for it Then he broke it in pieces and said This is my body which is given for you Do this in remembrance of me Would you hold that little wafer up It represents the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ freedom Lord we thank you for your broken body we thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us by your stripes we're healed the wounds that you were inflicted upon you for us for our healing today we say thank you Lord thank you thank you and Lord I pray today if there's anybody in this building who needs a physical healing an emotional healing, a mental healing. God, that it would be done in Jesus' name by the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord. Shall we eat together? And in the same way, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people. It's an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing, Paul said, the Lord's death until he comes again. Hallelujah. Freedom is experienced complete. Initiated at the cross, consummated at the empty tomb, made available to whosoever will because of the price Jesus paid. Thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood. Thank you, Jesus, for the forgiveness of sin. Lord, you washed us and you cleansed us by the giving of your blood. And today we are redeemed and free for who the Son sets free is free indeed. We are truly free. And today we rejoice because of your blood doing that in our hearts and our lives. I love you, Jesus. Shall we drink together? Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's stand together. Let's stand together, lift our hands and tell him thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your freedom. The freedom that you've provided, the freedom that you've given, the freedom that you've made available to all whosoever will. To whosoever will. It is ours. It is ours. It is ours. I'm free today. I'm free today. I'm free. Freedom is mine because you live in me. I choose you, Jesus, and today you live in me. I thank you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm going to open up the altars. You like to come and pray. Come and spend some time before the Lord in prayer before we head out of this place and Bible study and other things. These altars are a beautiful place. I know it because I've prayed at them plenty. I know it because I helped to build them. <laughs> it's a beautiful place. Would you find a place of prayer? Would you do that before you leave? Freedom because of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. The blood of Jesus washes me. The blood of Jesus shed for me. What a sacrifice to save my life. Yes, the blood.